All right, maybe we should just get started. Michael, you all set? I'm all set. All right, let me just briefly kick this thing off. I should introduce myself first. I'm Peter Siegelman, the acting temporary interim director of the Insurance Law Center at UConn Law School. And I'm really delighted to welcome everybody to this first ever new ideas and in insurance lecture series. Uh, the Insurance Law Center is the leading academic center in the US for the study of insurance law and risk regulation. So we're really pleased to sponsor this new initiative. Um, over the course of the spring, we're gonna have lectures about all aspects of insurance and how it relates to the rest of life. And so I invite you to tune in, not just for today's, but for uh, those in, in uh, succeeding weeks, you can register and get an automatic email reminder about that uh, in case you're uh, interested in the other topics as well. Before I introduce today's speaker, I just wanna thank a couple of people who've helped make this uh, all possible. First and foremost, Peter Kochenberger, who is the deputy director of the Insurance Law Center and an associate clinical professor of law here at the law school. We also had lots of help from Jean LeBlanc and Molly Sullivan to set up the design elements and from Ricardo Modales and uh, Mike Glenn who are here uh, helping us out with the tech aspects. Um, just briefly, I wanna introduce Michael Abramowitz who is the Oppenheim Professor of Law at the George Washington University Law School. Michael is in many ways the perfect person to kick off this series and not because his name, last name starts with AB, but because he is uh, the kind of Bobby Kennedy of law and economics. Uh, Bobby Kennedy famously remarked, uh, some see things as they are and ask why, I dream things that are not and ask why not. And Michael has always been that kind of a scholar uh, and intellectual, somebody who thinks imaginatively about things that don't yet exist and tries to help us use uh, markets and, and economics to bring about some of the possibilities that he's imagined for us. So today's talk is very much in that spirit. He's gonna talk to us about why we need a market and livelihood insurance and uh, why uh, and, and how we can uh, go about trying to take steps to make it possible. It's a huge pleasure to welcome him here. The ground rules are gonna be very simple. I suggest if you have a question, uh, you send it to me in the chat and I will then pose them at the end. Uh, we'll, we're trying this all out you know, for the first time, so who knows how this is all gonna work, but um, let's, let's just try that and we'll see how it goes. And if that turns out to pose problems, we can just uh, you know, move to something different. In the meantime, welcome Michael and the floor is all, or the E floor or whatever we call it these days is, is all yours. Thanks again for coming. Okay, uh, thank you so much. You, you can hear me, I assume? Yep. Okay, great. Yep. Um, and so uh, that was really one of the nicest introductions I've ever, uh, probably <laughs> I've ever received. Uh, let me just say, and um, kind of turn it back, that uh, I think the reason I really went into this whole field, uh, if, if I owe that to anyone, it's to you, Peter, because uh, when I was a senior in uh, college, uh, looking for a course to put, I saw something in the course catalog at Amherst, uh, called Law and Economics of Employment Discrimination. Well, that sounds kind of interesting. Uh, Cross-listed in uh, economics and uh, black studies, I believe. And uh, Peter was the professor, and we read lots of great articles and cases and really sparked an interest um, for me. Uh, I'm not sure if that's why I have a, a little side interest in insurance, but I, I know we sort of share that as well. Uh, and so thank you for that and, and for inviting me here. Uh, and I'm delighted to talk about an idea that really isn't my original idea, but I'll hopefully elaborate a little on the idea that's out there. And that is the idea of livelihood insurance. Let me share this uh, pretty minimalist PowerPoint. Uh, I assume you can all see that there. Okay. Cool. Yep. Um, so, you know, one of the uh, kind of puzzles I think that we have to face after COVID uh, is why our risk management institution broadly conceived uh, didn't do a better job of cushioning the economic shocks uh, associated with the pandemic. Uh, and we can imagine, you know, some kind of hypothetical parallel universe in which maybe there were, you know, lots of people with some, let's just say for now, some kind of uh, insurance, maybe uh, business interruption policies uh, in, in this ideal world would have been A, more widespread, and B, uh, included coverage for, uh, for pandemics. Uh, and so this kind of produces a mystery, you know, this mystery of the missing market. Uh, and there is, of course, a, a somewhat standard answer to this, which is that it's very hard to underwrite something like pandemic insurance because um, it's very hard to come up with 
reliable estimate of the probability that a, a pandemic will occur and, and an assessment of the loss that could be expected in the event of a uh, pandemic. Uh, in any event, of course, we didn't have this. Uh, and so we instead end up with a form of social uh, insurance, meaning that the government essentially tried to spend some money to, to cushion the economic blows. And uh, as we know, it did so in various ways. First, it uh, subsidized uh, some businesses, essentially giving them forgivable loans, which is basically like giving them uh, cash. Uh, and then it did things, uh, of course, for individuals like unemployment insurance and the like. And many critics have said that this effort was not terribly well targeted uh, to people who suffered losses uh, during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, that, that, to some extent, that may be a political debate. Uh, but to some extent, it also may reflect this inherent difficulties in a large administrative program like the tax system or any other kind of administrative program that you can spin up uh, in a very short period uh, of time. And I have a friend of the Treasury Department who tells me that it was very hard uh, for them to even do the incredibly simple, uh, relatively crude effort that they did to, to get that money out the door uh, relatively uh, relatively quickly. So I think it's sort of inherently hard for government uh, to, do, to kind of provide social insurance. Uh, and that heightens this question of uh, would it be, uh, could we imagine a world with some kind of uh, insurance? Well, but really what I'm interested in talking about today is not really insurance uh, in the conventional sense of a financial product being offered uh, by an insurance company. Um, the phrase livelihood insurance, I think at least properly understood uh, is perhaps a bit of a misnomer. Uh, and it's not my phrase. It comes from the work of, of Robert Schiller, uh, who won a Nobel Prize, not solely for this, although I think many of his related ideas, I think certainly help, uh, help him win the prize. Uh, and the basic idea is that of a, really a financial product, a financial security, I guess insurance is a financial product, but a financial security that one could obtain rather than individualized insurance product. And essentially my claim you know, that I want to push today uh, is that for pandemics, for the most part, something like that is probably better tailored to the risk. That is, it, it, it's probably better to have just a simple financial security that people could buy rather than individualized insurance policies. Uh, and let me sort of explain the basic idea of how this would how such a, a thing would work. So for example, let's say restaurant workers um, might be interested in purchasing a security uh, whose payout is inversely correlated with the relative wages of restaurant workers. Okay, so if restaurant workers have a really bad year, you know, whether it's because of a pandemic uh, or because of robots uh, or just because you know, people have you know, discover the joy of cooking, uh, then this security might pay. Maybe, and maybe it only pays out something if it's, you know, it's, uh, at least some minimum large drop relative to, you know, the average performance of, of other uh, of other steps. And uh, anybody could buy it, right? Anybody could buy this financial product, but who would be most likely to buy it? Well, probably restaurant workers, maybe restaurant owners feel like, well, okay, here's this product and my welfare is probably uh, correlated with that of my employees, so I'll buy it, uh, perhaps some others. Uh, but you wouldn't have to prove uh, that you are a restaurant worker to, to buy this product. So what's the value of that relative to an individualized uh, product? And I think the basic argument is that you avoid uh, moral hazard uh, and you avoid adverse selection. And adverse selection, I think, is the bigger one. Uh, that is, once we have an individualized product, uh, then one worries anyway. Maybe it's not always true that like Peter has actually shown in a great article. Uh, but it's often the, the case, or at least it could be the case, that the people most likely to seek the insurance are those most likely to, to need it. Uh, and that you know, leads to an increase in the price of insurance. And then maybe some other people uh, who otherwise would like the insurance product don't purchase the insurance. And so you have a, a separating equilibrium in which only some people get it, or maybe even worse, you have an unraveling in which it, nobody ends up buying. So that's that's the basic adverse selection story for, for insurance. And obviously, we overcome it 
uh, in many contexts, and maybe we could here. Uh, but the nice thing about livelihood insurance is that there is no adverse selection problem. Uh, why? Because the payout of the product is not tied specifically to the incomes of those who purchase it. It's tied to some other, some index in effect of how restaurant workers, let's say, are doing in the, uh, in the economy. Uh, and so each restaurant worker can make uh, his or her own decision about, you know, how much of this do I want to purchase based on their individualized risk. Uh, but, you know, any one person is only going to have a tiny effect on the overall index and thus the overall payout. So we, I think for most purposes, we can just assume that to be zero effect. So there's essentially no adverse selection. Um, and then um, on the moral hazard angle, I, you know, I don't think that's as significant a concern. Um, but you might wonder, uh, for example, maybe insurance companies might worry that a business purchasing a policy you know, might fail to take some precautions that would allow them to remain open during a pandemic, like installing a better ventilation uh, a ventilation system. And think, well, I'm covered anyway, uh, so I'm not going to take those precautions. And so that can be a source of economic efficiency. Okay. And so for the most part in this talk, this is what I mean by livelihood insurance is this financial security. Now, I should note that I, the reason Robert Schiller did call it livelihood insurance, I think, is because he actually well, acknowledging that possibility also imagine something a little more complicated, uh, where in fact, the payout is dependent on one's own wages as well. That is, uh, he, the policy would only pay out if restaurant workers overall uh, had some, you know, great fall in income and if the purchase, person purchasing it had, had a rather large fall. And basically my argument against that um, is that <laughs> then you lose the benefits of you know, moral hazard, adverse selection, you, and as a result of that, there's much greater transaction stock, right? The insurance company has to pay attention uh, to whom it's dealing with, uh, has to assess those people, you know, as part of the underwriting, risk classify them as part of the underwriting process, uh, and that can be very, very costly, and I think takes away a lot of the benefits of the product. Now, one could certainly imagine, you know, some kind of hybrid product, uh, but at least, you know, for ease of exposition, uh, I'm going to sort of talk about what I think of as pure livelihood insurance. Uh, which is that pure financial security. Um, so, you know, this problem of restaurant workers in the pandemic is really not unique to pandemics. I think there are lots of problems where you could imagine losses not just being correlated, uh, as they often are, you know, in, in let's say, hurricane uh, but, you know, extremely, very highly correlated. Not perfectly. I'm not sure there are restaurant workers who are just fine. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, but still, I think there's high correlation. Um, you know, even something like flooding, which is maybe pushing the limits of where this might be useful, uh, because some houses might flood while others don't. You know, certain neighborhoods might flood in hurricanes. You might want to say, well, if if there's widespread flooding in my neighborhood, I'd like a payout. Uh, and again, that would be lower transactions costs. So, was that better than regular flood insurance? I don't know, but to me, it should be part of the policy mix. Moreover. Uh, I think livelihood insurance could be used in theory for just different kinds of changes in performance, sectoral changes. So for particular industries just don't do well uh, over time. Actually, Schiller's original kind of example in his book uh, is of somebody who's considering going into becoming a, a recombinant DNA scientist. Uh, and they're worried, well, you know, what happens if it turns out this, this DNA stuff, you know, is not that big a deal. Uh, in, in the future. And so in effect, they're trying to ensure against the possibility that the whole field turns out to kind of be a waste and that all that education. You know, or you can imagine that maybe, maybe the modern equivalent would be something like people investing, you know, all their human capital in quantum computers, where there's still a lot of debate. You know, are we going to have quantum computers that actually matter or not? Uh, and they could buy this kind of product. But, you know, it could be for something like the auto industry as well, or the auto industry in a particular geographic region, or it could just be the geographic region. So, uh, you're very tied to a particular area. Uh, and here, really, there is a product, and it's really due in large part to Schiller. Uh, and that is a kind of financial security tied to the value of homes in, in particular, uh, in particular regions. And one puzzle, really, is why has that not taken off more? It exists, uh, unlike the livelihood insurance, but it hasn't taken off. Maybe we could even imagine something like this as a way of cushioning recessions at a national level, uh, you know, pretty hard when you're dealing with a country like the United States. 
uh, but maybe not impossible um, if we can create those pools of capital. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, but I want to talk about some other obstacles to livelihood insurance first. And I think one obvious obstacle uh, is just that we would need those indices, right? And so for, for housing prices, uh, Ace and Schiller, you know, got together and they actually basically created a business that collected this data. And so that's possible. I mean, this is not that hard for the government um, to do because the government already collects financial information on everybody in tax forms. You know, if you just have to put in a code about your, um, you know, what industry you work in or something like that, uh, the government could easily produce data on this. So I think that's the easiest one for you to overcome. Uh, I think there are two other uh, two other problems. One is probably the most important is consumer information. I mean, let's assume, suppose there is a product out there, and you know the people in this in this group all say, yeah, this is actually something. Given the prices they're selling at, that would really be a useful product for people. That information, you know, that is useful, doesn't really necessarily you know translate to consumers, and it's going to be the rare consumer who really wants to be an early adopter on it. Right? I mean, yeah, it's one thing to buy fire insurance. Everybody buys fire insurance. Uh, but it's another thing to buy some entirely novel financial product and one where it's really hard to gauge exactly you know, what the expected payout is relative to the amount that you're putting in. Um, now, maybe that's actually a little hard to gauge for regular insurance, too. I'm sure somebody in this room can help me. Like, there, there must be some statistics on this for different areas, you know, like automobile insurance and things like that and different providers. Uh, at least quick Google search could give me the answer uh, to exactly how do, you, how do you calculate that. And I think this would be harder, right? It's a novel product. Um, it'd be hard to explain the ideas of moral hazard and adverse selection, why this is better than something else, uh, why you'd want to buy insurance on not just on your welfare, but on sort of a group welfare, how that makes sense. I, I think there are reasons it does, um, but I think you know, the, it, it's very hard to get to the point where consumers sort of say, oh, yeah, well, of course, everyone buys that, so I'm going to invest in that as well. Uh, and I think there's a flip side problem, and, and it's a closely related problem in terms of supply. Because right? you might say, wait a minute, the consumer problem has an answer, which is just that some insurance company or, or other kind of financial company uh, comes in as the first mover and offers some product you know, and promotes the heck out of it you know, and, and basically takes on the kind of educational mission. I don't know if that consists of, of, of books uh, or of Super Bowl ads, um, but you know, they take on this mission with the hope of getting a lot of the market. And I think there is a problem here, which is that if this kind of insurance exists, uh, I think it even much more so than regular insurance, should be very easy for consumers to compare prices of, of different providers. Uh, because it's, it's a pretty simple product, and we don't need a whole lot of exclusions. It's really just an index that right? we're focused on. It's an index, and so you should, you should be able to tell pretty easily who's giving you the best deal. Well, the problem with that is that the, there's sort of a second mover advantage. If one company comes in and invests heavily in promoting the product, then other companies uh, you know, may join the market uh, and get equal market share. And so it's, it's hard to be able to appropriate the value of your investments in educating consumers. And so I think that's a prime reason that this product uh, hasn't existed and, and, and may not in the first place. So that leads us sort of to the question of, of a governmental role. You know, and we could certainly imagine a very ambitious governmental role uh, where the government actually requires it. And the government requires, at least in a lot of places, automobile insurance or a bond or something like that. Uh, so you could imagine a universal uh, insurance problem. But I think there's a lot of practical problems with implementing such a thing, even though livelihood insurance is a relatively simple product. You know, one is that presumably you'd have to let people self-sort into, you know, what industry are they, right? Because even if you're in one industry now, you might be planning on a different one uh, next year. Uh, and but if the government has a requirement that you buy the insurance, then you you, you might want to sort of evade that requirement by buying you know, a policy that just has a very, very high probability of payout. Uh, and you know, essentially, you put your money in, and more or less, you get your money out. Uh, and it's not so easy to regulate. I mean, we do in various ways in health insurance, for example, getting to really health insurance in some meaningful sense. Uh, but I think it's, it, it's, not at least, it's at least not a trivial problem uh, to overcome. It. And simply, how much insurance do we want? Right? I mean, you might, you might say, well, you should buy the optimal amount that will you know, maximally 
you know, optimally smooth your future income flow, that varies a lot from industry to industry. Uh, and you know, one nice thing about livelihood insurance is that there would be some price signals, right? If people are in intending to spend their whole life driving Uber, you know, they might start getting price signals that those Uber drivers may be in trouble uh, at some point in the, in the future. Taxi drivers in New York a few years ago could have used a price signal like that. Um, so that would be good, but you know, but that would require us to you know mandate that you receive at least some percentage of of uh, you know downside risk in, in the insurance uh, to kind of really make that work, so that people can see you know really see the value and really at least have full protection. Uh, and you know that brings us back to the self sorting stuff. So how do you overcome this? Not easily. I mean, you can imagine something like a um, fiduciary duty requirement on brokers, you know, to get you insurance that is you know, actually tailored to your um, actual business need. I'm a little skeptical that that's really going to be effective uh, in constraining brokers. Maybe we could imagine some kind of supercharged fiduciary duty requirement, but that's something for another day. So some more modest rules for the government. I've already talked about information collection and distribution, right? Ideally, you want the government not merely to be, you know, collecting, you know, a simple data, but giving a lot of information, right? Because uh, one might be interested um, in not just the average in an industry, but what about people who are making, you know, X dollars in 2021? Uh, how much uh, did they end up making in 2023 in this particular industry and how much over time and, and so on? So there's a lot of different information that could be collected uh, in the studio. Now that might lead you to wonder, well, maybe another thing the government could do is try to provide people some information on expectations uh, of income of people in particular industries, in, you know, livelihood insurance payments aside, right, which would give some people some indication of whether they need something like livelihood insurance. Um, and so in my, one of my other um, life sort of, I've, I've written a lot about prediction markets, which are uh, essentially mechanisms, and in fact, where people bet you know, on value. So some of you may be familiar with political prediction markets where people bet, you know, on who would run, who would win the, oh, let's say, the, the 2020 election. Um, and um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but, you know, it predicted pretty high chance that, that Biden would win the election. And moreover, there's a literature that shows these are relatively effective over time. I could talk a lot about how these work and so forth, uh, but I, I won't go into detail. But you could imagine the government sponsoring prediction markets uh, so that they can tell people not only, well, here's what the index is now, but here's what the market expectation of the index will be in the future. Okay, and so in, in, in the book on prediction markets, I talk a lot about how the government could have kind of sponsor these forecasting markets for lots of different kinds of things that might be of interest to people and policymakers. And so this would just be another one, uh, another thing. And by the way, there's a governmental role here, partly because it's very hard for private parties to make these markets because of regulatory issues. Uh, concerns about gambling, concerns about approval from the CFTC. I mean, you can do it uh, you can, if, you, if you go the formal way, but the transactions cost almost swamp the benefit. Now, if the government actually sponsored the prediction market, not only would it really be sort of a market maker, uh, bringing together buyers and uh, bringing together people on both sides of the prediction, but in effect, it would be selling livelihood insurance uh, because you can simply buy the shares that will pay off, you know, in the event. Uh, let's say that incomes fall uh, a, a certain percentage. So by serving as market maker and, and making these prediction markets, what the government would really be doing is offering the product itself, bringing together on the one hand, people who want to protect themselves, and on the other hand, people who are willing to essentially place some of their capital uh, aside so that those people can be uh, paid off, right? So, uh, you know, and, this, and there's an analogy here, obviously, to something like the cash bond uh, that, the, the idea is we find people who say, okay, yeah, I'd like something with a high return uh, and I'm willing to put my capital in. Uh, and, you know, on the other side, the people buying the catastrophe bonds or people or institutions uh, that are subject to risk of certain kinds of catastrophes. That's essentially what a, a pandemic prediction market would be. Uh, and I, I think there's some reason to think, you know, eventually, but may, maybe again, not in the short term for some of these reasons about market uncertainty and so forth that there would be hedge funds and, and other kinds of large financial institutions that would essentially take the other side of the bet uh, because it would you know, pay, off a relatively, pay off relatively well. And finally, of course, you can imagine the government serving as a subsidizer. If you have these prediction markets or even some other financial product run by third parties, there are various ways of subsidizing them. 
um, you know, paying some percentage of the cost is, is, is the simple way. You know, I think the more attractive thing for the government is often to say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll guarantee your, you know, we'll guarantee you on the back end because maybe for budgetary reasons, uh, it won't look like it's as expensive that way. I think that's less than, less than desirable. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, that's, that's the basic idea. Again, really Schiller's idea. Uh, and Michael really just to explain it. Oh, let me stop sharing. Um, screen there. Okay. And I'm happy, of course, to take any questions and ideas. And I, I know this is a very knowledgeable group that's really much more knowledgeable than me about insurance. So I'm really uh, delighted with any help you could you can provide me in thinking about this. Great, thank you very much. So I'm not sure actually my initial uh, attempt to run this made sense. Instead of instead of chatting the questions to me, why don't you just raise your hand and I'll call on you. And since no one has raised their hand yet, let me just jump in and ask the first one or two. So two, I mean, there, there's one of the great things about this is just makes you wonder about all kinds of stuff. And I have a million questions I'd love to ask. Hopefully we can discuss those later. Um, two questions are the pricing problem and also the regulatory problem. So the pricing problem is someone's got to try to figure out not just what's the what's the likely uh, trajectory of the coal industry or Uber or whatever. They have to figure out what are the risks that might affect, uh, you know, like the restaurant industry. It's not like we think the restaurant industry is about to go into long-term decline. It's that something is disrupting restaurants and nothing else. So you have to you have to price all that in, and it does not seem like that's going to be an easy task. Uh, you know, markets are good at that kind of thing, I guess, but it's going to be pretty tough. The other is the regulatory thing. If the government's not backing this. You're asking the consumer to assume that uh, when the time comes when the restaurant industry does go into the tank, that there will be someone there uh, who will pay the you know pay out after they've uh, they've paid. So how, how does how do you structure that to make sure that uh, the product is actually delivers when it's supposed to deliver? Um, that seems like it's going to be a big problem. Okay. Um, good. So let me actually let me go backwards to start with the solvency problem. I mean, obviously, one possibility, you know, is, is just some form of solvency regulation. And um, you know, I'm not saying that's a perfect or an easy uh, area to deal with, but it, it's a it's a um, it's a problem that we confront somewhat in uh, regulating reinsurance and, and thinking about the possibility of, of kind of um, you know tail end risks uh, that we face. I think if you have a prediction market. You know, the nice thing about that, and, and, and really this fits with catastrophe bonds more generally, is the capital is set aside in advance, right? You don't, you don't need solvency regulation. I mean, the whole, the whole idea uh, is essentially that they provide the money, it's sitting there, and you can allow it maybe to be in some relatively safe investment vehicle. But, but basically, the, the idea is the counterparty is, is, has, has put the money up initially. Uh, and the only question is, who's going to get the money, you know, in the back end of the deal? Is it going to be the, the counterparty or is it going to be the, the insured? Uh, and so we just need to make sure that there's, I guess, if there were a debate about it, right? If it were unclear whether the condition were met, you know, you could have a court case. Uh, but overall, oh, I think the requirements for courts are, are pretty minimal uh, in this uh, in this case. And so the pricing problem, uh, and you know, it, it, this is interesting because I, I know that this is a difficult problem, and 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 people often fall back on the sort of distinction between you know, risk and uncertainty, uh, focusing, you know, saying, well, risk is something that we can measure, you know, kind of from past experience. And uncertainty, uh, you know, we're just kind of relying on, you know, what I guess we call subjective probability estimates, um, but that don't really necessarily have a foundation uh, in reality. Uh, and, you know, I guess I would push back a little bit on that. I mean, first of all, I think there's lots of insurance um, that, depends, you know, in some way on, you know, what I think would have to be classified as things like uncertainty. I and mean, obviously, you know, life insurance, you know, depends on, you know, what's going to happen to the future trajectory of um, lifespan. And yeah, okay, we can look at the past and we can generalize the future. Uh, but, you know, there's there, there are there's certain uncertainties about the, you know, what future medicine is going to allow us to do and, and, and so on and so forth. So I feel like it's actually a problem that we solve in a lot of context. In any event, I guess I would say on the, you know, on the prediction market side, I mean, prediction markets are, are, are good at this. I mean, prediction markets aggregate these kinds of, you know, imponderable uncertainties all the time. Uh, and I think can do so effectively. Now, I suppose you might say, look, I'm asking for prediction market, which, with, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of times more capital uh, involved than a typical prediction market. Uh, but you know, I think you have a lot. You have actors that are incentivized to get large returns, like hedge funds, uh, and they're probably going to want to put some percentage of their money in this. And you know, yeah, at some point, it's not entirely unsystematic risk, right? Which you could just say, well, it's to be diversified away for free uh, in a diverse portfolio. You know, it becomes systematic risk because I don't know, restaurant workers are correlated with restaurants, uh, stocks, and things like that. Uh, but you know, I think people who are looking for that extra bit of return are going to be pretty attracted to this. And they're going to say, well, you know, what's the chance of something like robots or a pandemic or so forth? Um, you know, and yeah, I, I understand some people might say, well, you can measure the pandemic because we know the frequency of those. The robots is harder. I actually think both of those are kind of imponderable. I mean, is are we now in a new era where there's going to be more pandemics? I mean, there's some people who say that. You have to factor that in. So I think you can't avoid imponderables. I think markets can do it. I think the past of bonds have not been super successful, um, but they have managed to do that at least, uh, at least somewhat. Maybe I know some people might push back on that. Okay, I see. I see we have a question in the chat. So um, yeah, one way to address yeah. the consumer problem is, or Jeff, you want to ask the question? Yeah. Jeff, yeah, go ahead. Nope, Dan, Jeff is not asking. So, okay. Michael, you want to front just to the chat? Sorry, this is sure. So, one one way to address the consumer problem is if employers offer it as employment benefit. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think then the question becomes: Do consumers value the product more when it's offered as a benefit? And, and I think the argument would be yes. Uh, right, so, first of all, there's two possibilities. First, one of them is maybe that's how we subsidize it by saying, well, if when employers give it to you, you know, it doesn't count as taxable income. Uh, of course, that's just one way of subsidizing it. It costs the government no matter what. You know, anything you do to subsidize it is going gonna, is gonna to make it more attractive on the margin. So that's certainly a possible mechanism of subsidy, but I'm not committed to that. You know, the other possible benefit of the employer approach uh, is that you might figure that your employer has taken some time to research it you know, and has thought about what might be a good product for you, uh, especially if we're talking about employment, you know, livelihood. Your employer presumably has some idea of your livelihood. Still, though, I think, you know, even there it's challenging because there may be employers, for example, that have lots of people with very different livelihoods. So my employer, you know, has doctors and lawyers and accountants and, you know, janitors and, you know, all kinds of people doing all kinds of different things uh, whose livelihood probably depends less on the fate of the university than on the fate of, of their individual uh, profession. So, you know, employers could do it, but I, I'm not sure that that would convince consumers. And I guess that presents an extra puzzle. Why haven't they done it? Uh, why hasn't anyone offered it for them to do? Uh, and, you know, which I try to answer to, but maybe there are other answers as well. Okay, I have a queue of Dan Schwartz and Asaf Lubin, so go ahead, Dan. Hi. Hi, Michael, how are you doing? Great, great. good to see you. Thank you for, thank yeah. you for coming. No, yeah, it's great. I, you know, it's it's neat actually. There are more people here than you know if, if we were in person. So, good. <laughs> um, uh, 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 so, so I have two questions that really point to sort of one to demand and one to supply, and okay, go are, ahead. Are, are geared off of the practical dimension. So, okay, on the supply, I didn't hear the last part. Are geared off. Are the... geared towards some points you've already mentioned. Okay. So, on the supply part. Um, I guess I'm a little skeptical that you would find much capital willing to supply this insurance based on our experience with uh, cap, cap bonds. You know, you mentioned, yes, we have some cap bonds, but, you know, the cap bond industry is 20 years in the making and still uh, very much it has sort of routinely been below expectations in terms of growth. And it seems to me like... Uh, uh, cap bonds are much more attractive investment and workable investment than this because the trigger of coverage is much easier to uh, uh, determine um, and because there's an argument to be made that natural catastrophes are not uh, correlated with more broad economic indexes. So I think if we start with saying, well, we've had real supply side problems with catastrophe bonds, and we say this is going to be much harder than catastrophe bonds, the, the natural instinct is to say we're not going to find a lot of supply. And then on the demand side, my, my, my instincts are similar, which is, you know, uh, uh, we've had very little demand for 
a, a home equity insurance, even though actually this has been an idea that's been around for 25 years. I actually, I, I just tried to Google it. Uh, again, I couldn't figure out a way to buy it. The first thing that came up was Robert Schiller's article. The second thing was a Wikipedia thing. And the third thing was a, was a, a, a brochure from an insurer that wanted me to call them. Apparently, I can't buy this online. And, like, it wasn't even clear to me it was legit, you know? Like, so if people aren't willing to buy this on their home equity, uh, uh, that, to me, again, almost seems like a more attractive thing than uh, buying it on my livelihood because livelihood goes up and down and because I might not, you know, I already have unemployment insurance and I already have social safety nets. And so if we can't convince people to buy home equity insurance, uh, 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 why on earth do we think we're going to be able to convince people to buy, buy this type of insurance given that they already have a number of protections in the livelihood domain that they don't have in the, the home equity domain? Okay, good. You know, and, and and maybe on top of that, with livelihood insurance, there's the sort of you know Samaritan's dilemma. You think the government's going to come in and help you, um, whereas the government's certainly not going to come in and help you when your when your house. Is also, right yeah, now. and one other thing, I also think there's more basis risk here than there is in home equity insurance. In home equity insurance, you can be pretty, even though it's based on an index. You know, it's probably a pretty good. Uh, 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 there's probably a pretty good correlation between the, the index going down and your personal loss. You know, the basis risk here between, you know, oh, some restaurants go under, but, you know, some some restaurants are doing better because they've, they're they tailored to takeout and they've, you know, or is, so it just seems like they're, you know, given the base lines on both cases are show a pretty bad track record. And then we sort of, you know, <laughs> we're working in the wrong direction on both sides. I guess to me, that seems like, reason to be skeptical and i'm just wondering what your what your sense of that is sure and you know i've uh, you know to some extent i guess i'd say i'm skeptical too in the sense that my claim is certainly not that i think this is going to take off um i, I you know the, the question is could we make it take off i mean i guess one claim is look i think this is a better bet for the government to spend its time on than trying to invest in conventional pandemic insurance you know which some people have, have suggested along the lines of anti-terrorism insurance i, I don't think that's I think that's very unlikely to, to um, you know, do well. Other than with the government continuing, you know, at a high at a high subsidy, which here I feel like, well, maybe if this got going, it it would at least emerge as a product. Now, with respect to the home value insurance, um, a lot of the same experiences as you, you know, and I looked at the volume statistics, and a lot of it for a lot of periods it seemed to be zero. You know, so I mean, basically, I think this is a failed product. Um, and you know, I think there are some reasons. I think there are a lot of reasons. First of all, I think the same basic reason I give for this, which is that consumers don't really know, right? And people say, oh, well, you could buy home value insurance. And, and first of all, even if they get the idea, you know, that this is good, even if they understand, oh, wait a minute, this is a security, so the transactions cost must be low, right? Because I think what consumers worry about is they think, somebody else, if, if I buy this, somebody else is making a ton of money off of it, you know, which is actually not really true, uh, but that's what they think, right? And so I think it requires a certain degree of takeoff before, you know, the word gets out, a lot of takeoff before the word gets out that, you know, the transactions costs are, are, are pretty low. There's no one else, you know, making a huge amount of money uh, off of your purchase of this derivative. I think consumers are also hesitant to buy home value insurance because uh, they care about, just, you know, a lot, a lot of people plan to stay in the same metropolitan area no matter what, and they don't plan to sell their house. Uh, and if you don't plan to sell your house, well, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it all goes down. I mean, in, in, in a sense, you know, the, it went down in value, but everybody else's house went down in value too. You're still living there. Um, you know, obviously there should be people who own houses for short periods of time who should buy this product, but that now is, now is the market. On supply, you know, I think the cat bond issue is a real question. And I guess what I would say is, how do you know, and, and you may have an actual answer to this, uh, how do you know that that is a, supply side issue rather than a demand side issue. I mean, I, I would think that if there were, you know, enough people willing to buy them, that somebody would supply it. I mean, maybe that's this, you know, the sort of standard economic intuition uh, that I have about every product you know, that, that exists. A lot of people report, it's a, you know, it's more anecdotal. A lot of people report it's more of a supply side problem. I think that a lot of Maybe I'm wrong. It's it, it's just anecdotal, but that's what I've heard more. So, yeah, I mean, I guess the question would be, 
you know, relative to what some hypothetical, you know, neutral, you know, actuary or, you know, weather forecaster or whatever, you know, would suggest would be an actuarially fair price. You know, what price is it? Because you can buy, right? I mean, there, there are, you know, people taking the other sides of these deals, but as you say, it's a smaller industry that in some sense we think it logically uh, should be. Uh, you know, and, and so is there data on that? I mean, do we know? Are these people who are providing it, you know, getting these huge returns or expected to get huge returns, even given the expected incidence of catastrophe? I don't know. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm just not sure it's a, it really a supply side story. I wouldn't be surprised if they're paying for it. And if, you know, they're also a little un, uncertain that they have to sell their own products, like their hedge funds to other people. And so, you know, that's also kind of a demand side function, right? If you say, oh yeah, I've got a hedge fund, uh, by the way, you know, a lot of what we're invested in is something that you, you're going to lose all your money if there's a big hurricane in, uh, I don't know, wherever, uh, Alabama. Uh, then, you know, it, that becomes a consumer problem, too, because consumers don't know how to value then the, you know, the counterparty's equity. Uh, so I'm not sure it's a supply side problem, but it's a hard problem and you know, not one that's going to be easily overcome. Okay, next on the queue is Asaf Lubin, and I have nobody else, so if you want to get on, please raise your hand and I will call on you. I think Tuso had a question as well. Okay. Oh, uh, so thank you so much. This is fascinating. Um, I, I would love to hear a little more about what you consider to be the triggering events and the exclusions in a policy like this. In particular, it wasn't obvious to me why you're grouping together the pandemic scenario with the robot scenario. In particular, as I'm thinking about a pandemic scenario, that's an area where there's a temporary hindrance on the ability of the profession to run its traditional course and make the same kind of efficient uh, wealth. Um, but that will go away after a couple of years and the industry will supposedly return back to its normal uh, nature. Whereas the robot scenario is one about automation destroying the profession as it currently exists. So like, I don't understand why we would want the government to subsidize the town crier. The town crier is going to go away. It might be better instead for the government to subsidize educational programs to turn the town crier into a Facebook developer um, instead of to subsidize a market that will provide insurance policies for, for the town crier's livelihood in that sense. So, so my question, I guess, is why are we grouping all of these together and should we have different triggering events for and exclusions for, for deciding which types of situations to be insured or not in these in these scenarios? Okay. Great, yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, I, I do think it makes sense to tie them together in the sense that, you know, if you're a worker, um, and you face risk over some time period, let me come back to that in a moment, over some time period of your, of, you know, that you, your whole profession just went down the tube. It doesn't really matter what the source of the risk is. Now, you could argue that, that there's a supply side issue here as well, that, you know, supply might be easier if there was only one risk, right? The people, maybe they can measure the probability of a pandemic, but it's hard to measure the robots or vice versa or something like that. So you could separate them. And you could, right? We could say, we could imagine a version of this if that's really an issue. Uh, that says there's going to be a payout only if you know the incomes of restaurant workers fall more than 20 percent of than the average income falls, uh, and we're talking about a year in which you know the World Health Organization has declared a pandemic. You, you could do that as well, um, but I, I think for a lot of people, I think the real issue that they face is uh, livelihood, whatever the source might be. You know, and there may be some threats to livelihood, you know, that we really haven't anticipated at all, uh, or, you know, maybe technological advances that come out of nowhere. Now, in terms of the government subsidy, so uh, first, if we put aside the government subsidy, you know, then I think it makes a, a lot of sense for the town crier, you know, to say, hmm, you know, maybe at some point we're not going to need a crier because we have the internet, uh, I like the example, uh, and, you know, they say they might develop this internet thing. I don't really think so. Uh, so I'm gonna keep working on my crying, um, <laughs> but you know, but I'm gonna buy this. I'm gonna buy this product just so that then you know I'll have the money to go get retrained, you know, in you know, in, in IT or something. Um, if if crying goes out of fashion, uh, so that's that's it. Now then the question is, well, why should the government subsidize it? Uh, and you know, part of the argument is, well, if you subsidize it, you you may be delaying the exit of people from the industry. Uh, and I think that is a concern, 
uh, that you know if we maybe people are already kind of you know hedging their human capital bets uh, and not going in you know maybe fewer people are going to pilot school or something because you know they think drones are going to become ubiquitous. Um, I just think that people aren't that good at that, and people maybe aren't doing that. And if you had even a subsidized product, at least it would provide some kind of signal, right? I mean, people might be surprised if they saw hmm, the market thinks that there's like a 20% chance there's going to be no pilot job. I'm, I'm just sorry, making up number. Uh, the 20% chance that there's going to be no pilot jobs uh, in 10 years, or you know, some of you might think I really thought that lawyers were like totally like you know impervious to technology, but now people think there's a 10% chance that you know one of these new uh, natural language, GPT-3, or one of these new algorithms is going to take away my job, you know, maybe that should affect people on, on the market. I probably won't if it's 10% very much. I mean, I'm not margin yet, but, uh, but if it's 50%, as it might be for, you know, some 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 jobs, maybe it would. Uh, so in any event, I just think you feel bad for people who have these transitional problems. I think there is a governmental role in providing some form of, you know, social insurance for them. Uh, there's, you know, a tradition of talking about these things, for example, for trade adjustment assistance, right? We're going to have more free trade and help people uh, who are hurt. I mean, it's basically a failure uh, as it is now, but I think the concept is is right. And so I, I think there is a role, for to me, there is a role, although it may slightly hinder econo- useful economic adjustment. You started your explanation with that for a time period clause. Oh, yeah. Can you clarify that? Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I think one question people have is like, well, what time period do I want to buy this policy for? You know, and obviously, in a sense, if you buy it for your whole life, right, if you say, well, if my, you know, income ever falls below, you know, or the income of restaurant workers ever falls below this, I, I, I want to be covered. Uh, that's going to be very expensive, um, you know, especially if you're going to be covered for the rest of your life. Um, so, you know, I do think people would have to make their own judgment. I mean, and this is one reason it's really hard for consumers to, to figure out. You know what? You know what's the chance you know, for me? Well, what's, what's the chance that you know law schools all go out of business? And, you know when would it happen? You know, and if they did, what what would be my alternative employment? You know, how much of the stuff do I actually need? You know, because one point, and, what, and this is actually a very key point about livelihood insurance, uh, is that it meant if if everybody can adjust perfectly, it doesn't pay out, right? So if all the lot people working in restaurants as waiters, you know, become delivery people and make the same salary, you know, I don't think that's what's happening. Uh, but if that did happen, then it wouldn't pay out anything, which is good, right? Because they haven't really been harmed. Um, but, you know, it, it makes it very hard to determine what time period should I buy? How much should I invest in? And I, I think that's one of the one of the difficulties for this uh, financial product. Okay, so, thanks. So I have a queue of Tom Magnuson, Tushar Ahuja, Pat McCoy, and Haley Hinton. Uh, so, Tom, you are next. I don't know. Thanks. Uh, thanks for talking today. I appreciate it. Um, so one one thing I thought of in terms of your uh, market, you know, disappearing is uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but wouldn't that wouldn't that really increase premiums uh, in those coming years? Because usually you see the writing on the wall towards the end, and all of a sudden those people couldn't really afford the insurance that at the time that it would be most effective or most uh, productive for them. That's one. And then the second part is I think there's a good argument. Just to comment really good argument for the government to subsidize in some fashion, probably on the back end in terms of, you know, taking on some of the overall risk from insurers as opposed to upfront costs to insurers. Uh, because it, as it's played out, um, at least with COVID, uh, they do end up paying. Um, my one concern though, is that how do you, how do you subsidize appropriately for the lower income people that, are disproportionately affected, especially in COVID nineteen. You see, the wealthy people um, have seemed to fare better, and 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 poor people um, have not. Yet, if you have to charge them a premium, that's a higher percentage of their overall earnings. Where where that would be you know, difficult for them to you know, purchase that insurance and affect their livelihoods, they may just be ter- deterred from buying it in the first place because pandemics are so rare, and they just kind of say it never pays out. So why do? It? Um, I know this, those are just some thoughts. Uh, I had of that, but I guess more to the first question of, of okay, great. Uh, a lot of good thoughts there. So, um, would premiums go up, uh, you know, over time as, as this became greater? Yeah, and and that's why you know the consumer faces this tough decision about should I buy, you know, in 2020 for 2025, right? To what extent have my human capital investments up to now do they mean that I really have to care, you know, about what's going to happen in a few years? Uh, because sure, it'll get more, it'll get more expensive down the line. Uh, easier to buy when the, the when the risk is 
uh, is lower. You know, government, the, the front end or the back end. So I think you're saying it makes sense for the government to support on the back end. Maybe partly because maybe it'll make it cheaper for the government because then it won't have to do some other, it won't have to do other things. It'll say, wait a minute, we're already, you know, we already committed to this livelihood insurance. Uh, and so we're going to pay that out. Uh, but, you know, therefore, we don't need to do as much of this other, you know, very untargeted, you know, basically giving businesses free money and, you know, other kinds of stuff like that. So um, that's interesting, although I also think if they were actually successful in doing it on the front end, you know, they could say, well, look, we have this great private insurance market and we don't do much. You know, and, and to some extent, I think people overestimate the government. I mean, even in COVID-19, I mean, yeah, the government's spending trillions of dollars, but it's, it's not a, I, I don't think it's covering a very large percentage of individual loss. And... Uh, you know, I think I think people, I think a lot of people have this idea that if they're affected by an earthquake or a hurricane or whatever, the government's going to kind of swoop in and, you know, yeah, they'll probably get like sheltered for a couple of nights or something like that. But um, you know, it's 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 not the government's not going to cover a high percentage of your uh, of your law. In terms of poor people, you know, I think there's some really kind of interesting questions, and and I'm sure there's been work done on this. Um, about you know why do we not see as much insurance purchase by poor people? Obviously, the pretty easy reason is they don't have as much money. Um, but you know, I think there's sort of a harder conceptual reason, which is to say, well, yeah, but why don't they just buy less insurance? Why isn't this sort of a product you can just buy a little less of? Uh, and you know, you would think people living on the edge, you know, might be even more concerned. I mean, if you're super rich, you know, you, you don't really need it. You can self-insure. Uh, you don't really need to worry too much about it. Um, so. That's an interesting question, whether the answer, you know, is in behavioral economics or whether it's something to do more with kind of transactions cost, if the transactions cost of any given policy is so high, you know, that it doesn't make it worthwhile if your income is lower. Uh, I'm not sure. Obviously, we could help the poor in lots of different ways. And, and here the question would be, does it make more sense, you know, to, you know, have to get the poor money, you know, Andrew Yang style, uh, or does it make sense to buy them insurance policy? Um, you know, I tend for it the first, but I, I would, you know, that could be wrong. I need to think more about that. Thanks. Okay, so uh, next up is Tushar. You have a comment in the chat, but you want to ask it again? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I understand that obtaining a livelihood insurance would, you know, cover certain aspects of, um, a disaster or, or certain disasters or certain pandemics such as COVID. However, it would not be, you know, completely fully encompassing uh, insurance contract. There would be some coverage issues that may come up. But if there is, if a pandemic such as COVID-19 actually takes place and all individuals and, you know, almost all businesses get affected by it, wouldn't a private company that is offering such an insurance run out of capital, even though they may have a big pool of capital available to them? Okay, good. Uh, and, and so, you know, to some extent, I, I see this as a, a version of the kind of solvency question. Um, and so part of the answer, I think, is that you have to make sure, you know, that some of the capital, either you have to have some, you know, really good reinsurance-like regulation uh, to make sure that there will be enough capital to, to, cover, to cover things. Uh, or uh, you need to have the capital just kind of sitting there in advance, either in you know cash or in you know securities that are pretty safe, treasuries or whatever, uh, to make sure that that capital is going to uh, is, is going to be there. One other kind of point I, I guess I'd make is that you know I I, suspect, I suggested as a sort of trigger you know that your income falls more than a percent more than everybody else. And I think COVID-19 is a pretty good example of this. I mean, yeah, there's worldwide losses. I mean, worldwide GDP, you know, is going down. You know, but it's not like everybody's lost 20% of their income. I mean, you know, the, the, the decrease in GDP. I mean, in a way, it's astounding uh, that I think that the world economy has done as well as it has. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe people have different priors about that. But my prior uh, would have been, you know, that given the kind of lockdowns we saw in as many cases at places as we did, it was a supply chain would just collapse. You know, I think this is why the stock market went way down at first um, and went back up when people saw eh, the supply chain seems to be working itself out uh, and, you know, business is not going to collapse. We're not going to end up with, you know, smooth holy tariffs uh, kind of preventing all trade and, uh, you know, so things actually kind of kind of work, uh, even though, of course, there was 
some kind of decline. So I feel, and, and that's part why the mystery I feel like is so great because there was enough money at this time for there to be some more dis, greater distribution. And you could imagine you know, that relatively wealthy people would say, oh, okay, well, my portfolio went down a little more, you know, because some of my portfolio was invested on the supply side of you know, the equivalent of cat bond. Um, but that we would have known from the beginning that, you know, ordinary people were covered and that didn't happen. Uh, and so that's uh, you know, part of the puzzle that's handling it. Uh, Pat McCoy, did you have a hand up? I don't see it up anymore, but if you oh, want to come in. This yeah, is yeah, I'd, I'd love to ask Great. a question. Um, you know, I'm thinking about back, back um, leading up to 2008, a lot of mortgages offered the opportunity to have um, credit linked insurance that, that um, would trigger with job loss. Uh, the, the payouts on those and the claims experience was just absolutely disastrous. Um, and uh, so it, against, against that background, I have a lot of doubts about how well a private claims process would work with a livelihood insurance pro product. And uh, meanwhile, when the government provides employment or joblessness assistance, not only is it trying to buoy individual workers, but it also has these major macro goals of stimulating spending. So, so one of the things I worry about to circle back to Peter Siegelman's timing question is if, if, if we mainly have this as a private product and we have a lot of back up with payouts, we're not going to get that, that stimulus effect. Um, and that's going to, I think, eventually push the federal government anyhow into having, having to enact emergency fiscal stimulus if it wants to get the spending going. So I, just, I was just like your thoughts on the broader macro workability of this. Okay, great. Yeah, and it's good to see you again, Pat, as well. Yeah, great to see you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so great questions. And I, I don't know uh, much about this credit linked insurance, so I need to find out more. But it, it, if I'm understanding you correctly, this is this is linked to your individual income as opposed to the group, or, or am I confused? Uh, yes, and it's, it's also linked to um, your having usually a mortgage. Okay. Both. So, you know, so I think, right, so, so of course the idea of the livelihood insurance is to take out sort of the individual factors. Uh, and part of your concern is this idea that maybe, or this problem, that maybe it'll take a while for the payments. I think that's what you mean by backed up. Uh, and if it takes a while for the payments, then first of all, it's not very useful. Right? When you're back at work, uh, you don't need the payment anymore. You needed it earlier. Uh, and I think this is actually ultimately an argument for at least livelihood insurance over, um, you know, some kind livelihood insurance you know, as a financial product over some kind of real pandemic insurance policy. Uh, because if it's a financial derivative, it just trades, right? I mean, it trades at a price. People say, oh, it's a pandemic. Uh, the price changes, and you can sell it at any time. Uh, and so you can get that insurance value. You don't have to wait for it. And so I think that is. Um, that is a value, and I think that could provide a macroeconomic stimulus. That is, if you know, we had a lot of people, you know, that on, on the downside, a lot of people lose a little bit on their retirement portfolios um, because they're invested again on the supply side. Uh, but then there's all these people who suddenly, you know, have lost their jobs, uh, but suddenly they have this cushion. You know, they're going to spend some of that money uh, from this, you know, uh, asset that's suddenly gone up in uh gone up in value now again that doesn't diminish the possibility of some kind of governmental role you know and i think for the foreseeable future this market is not going to take off to the point where where i think we would want the government to just say well you could have bought livelihood insurance so we're not going to give you anything um but government hasn't done that much now so i feel like if the government could you know simulate some purchasing of livelihood insurance, or at least get the market kind of somehow you know, jumpstart this market enough where it's, it's out there and people want to buy it, they can, uh, and then let it kind of fend for itself. That, that could maybe help with, with some things in the future. I, I, I would just um, add the caution that um, 
I would not assume that there will be a willingness to make payouts that are legally due. That are legally? Legally due to the policyholder. Yeah, I mean, you know, so I, certainly one proposal I have, the government runs the prediction market, right? And so the government is actually um, buying and selling new securities. Again, I think it's actually not, not that complicated. I mean, I, you know, for people who run the, you know, the CME or whatever would, would, would say otherwise. Uh, but to me, it, it seems like this is a product the government could provide. I do think, you know, you look at something like the CME, though, I mean, it, you know, if you have two own shares and you want to sell them, you can pretty much do that at any time. And one thing we saw in this pandemic is that there was plenty of capital, right, kind of looking for a place to sort of park itself. Um, and if the if you had these securities, you know, it would just kind of be a shift in, in the value. Right? There would be some that would go down in value, others that would go up in value. Uh, and I think it's pretty easy to liquidate these positions, whether the government is running the market, and certainly the government could, uh, or the other side. Because, because there's no, again, part, and, and that's one justification for why I don't think there should be a precondition, ideally, right? Where, we don't want to have 18 months of litigation about whether this was a pandemic or just a, a flu. Uh, well, of course, flu could be a pandemic too. Uh, a seasonal flu, or whatever. We, we'd like to have the payout right away, and, and I think you know financial markets allow for faster adjustment than than the insurance industry. I think. Okay, well, Michael, if you're willing to stick around, that would be great, but I think we need to excuse people who need to go since it's five o'clock. It's sort of weird to excuse people from a virtual world where anybody can log off anytime they want to, but um, I, please join me in thanking Michael for showing up and kicking us off with such a fascinating topic, and if you're willing to stick around, I'm, I, I have a lot more questions, and I'm sure others do too, but you're free to go at this point. Everybody, thanks for coming.